The people who run this country wouldn't use a word like famine. <coughs> but that is what the aid agencies are trying to prevent. For the telltale signs of a human catastrophe are all around in South Sudan. You see it in the eyes and extended bellies. And the international community has had to act. We traveled northeast to the epicenter of this crisis in an unstable region called Pibor. The fighting between different tribes has made it dangerous on the ground. An unprecedented flooding in South Sudan has washed down the roads. The only way to Pibor is in one of these. This humanitarian hub is supplied from the air, but the people who live here can no longer count on their second biggest donor. The UK has slashed its aid programs. A key fund worth 120 million pounds a year, indefinitely delayed, we're told, while money supporting rudimentary health clinics has been cut. This one-year-old, Korok, was brought in six days ago. She was severely malnourished and suffering from pneumonia. The child even had a very high fever, so we're treating with IV antibiotics and um, some uh, fluids. What would have happened if she hadn't been brought in? Uh, I cannot know for certain, but I don't think the child would have made it past the day of admission, or at most two days, uh, if they had not received uh, immediate medical attention. The number of severe, acutely malnourished children at this clinic has doubled in the past year. Yet the UK has cut the funding that supports clinics nationwide by almost £7 million. People will die, said the director of one NGO. We know that it's so unfriendly and so inhuman uh, for any country to cut its aid at this particular time. The South Sudanese government said it was notified of the cuts in a letter, but the UK hasn't provided any details. We ask ourselves as a government what had gone wrong between us and, and the British government. We felt that it's a time for them to double the effort to help us. South Sudan has lost its way since achieving independence 10 years ago. The country is poorly governed and poorly served by those elected to lead it and its citizens have suffered from near-continuous political and tribal war. Aid organizations have stepped in, but this is not an easy place to work. The people who operate our compound have told us to get out. During our stay in Pibor, we were evacuated from our rooms after a hostile tribe attacked the town. We've got to go through gates and down alleyways and through mud. Uh, Key thing is avoiding the open road. We reached the base of the UN Protection Force in Pibor and waited for the trouble to subside. Part of the job, I guess. Anything can happen anytime. Things are unpredictable here. The next day, the men in Pibor prepared themselves for war. They're members of the Murlay tribe, and they're organized into age groups, the youngest going into battle first. They were addressed by the chief administrator, who represents the national government, but he told them to defend their community at all costs. We don't know why my people, they are coming to attack us. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I cannot say something, yeah. but we are ready to fight. You're ready to fight? Yeah. Peace and sustenance are in short supply. Although British officials say South Sudan remains a top priority, despite the impact of pandemic-related cuts. But the UN's food program is running out of money, the UK reducing its contribution 
by 30%. We have had to take some really painful and difficult decisions. Um, so in the areas where we are trying to avert a famine, we are taking from the hungry to give to the starving. That's never an easy decision to take, but it's one we're forced to take this year. Food will get through if the money's found, with the WFP now flying in supplies to areas on the brink of famine. And the lives of millions depend on it. But Britain has decided this humanitarian mission comes at too high a price. John Sparks, Sky News, in South Sudan.